when I was growing up, I, I felt a deep sense of optimism about the future. I mean, back then, we were rocketing people to the moon. I mean, it was incredible. The future held so much promise and so much wonder. Today, most people that know about climate change have no problem accepting the science that burning coal, oil, and gas, and, and by the way, this is a piece of coal that seems completely harmless, that burning coal, oil, and gas is the single largest contributor to pushing our climate from climate change to climate shock. The seas are rising, we know that, and they will continue to rise significantly. Storms are getting stronger, and they're causing a lot more damage. Wildfires are more widespread, and the wildfire season every year is expanding by two to three months. Uh, our droughts are becoming more extreme and more widespread, and they are converting an increasing amount of land to desert. Our floods are more damaging, the heat waves are more destructive, and actually very bad for human health. Here in New York City, by 2050, the New York City Panel on Climate Change has told us that we can expect more than double the number of 90 degree plus days. That we should expect one to two feet of sea level rise here in New York by 2050. And that's not when it's going to stop. It will continue from there. Most of our children know about climate change. We teach them about it. I don't think that they're as optimistic about the future as we were when we were children. And I don't believe that we adults are as optimistic about the future either. Let me ask, by a show of hands, if I could give you, knowing what we're doing to the planet, if I could give you a one-way ticket to the year 2070, how many of you would go? I don't see any hands. And yet that is exactly where we're sending our children. Ten years ago, I learned of the urgency of the climate crisis. I understood that unlike the cyclical nature of other terrible things in the world, like wars and uh, the economy, uh, climate change would only get worse. I thought to myself, the general public will learn just like I did, and surely action will be broad and swift. So I put my talents to work. I'll focus on energy efficiency. That's what I do. And the renewable energy systems will take over and they'll replace our energy infrastructure. Soon we'll be free of the negative impacts of coal, oil, and gas, and I'll be part of it, and it's going to be awesome. Well, clearly, the timeline that I was anticipating was overly optimistic. I believe that for many of us, it seems like we'd have to sacrifice our lifestyle to be environmentally responsible. We pull up to the pump and we fill our gas tanks. We use electricity. We cook with gas. We buy products that we know have an environmental impact, but this is how we live. Psychologists tell us that we have something called loss aversion. We are, if we have a choice between avoiding a loss of something that we have versus acquiring a gain, that we most of the time will avoid the loss, will hang on to what we have. But we don't have to choose between losing our lifestyle and gaining a healthy environment. It's a false choice. For example, compared to Americans, Europeans have half the carbon footprint that we do. And yet, to borrow a phrase, they still have hot showers and cold beer. Our goal is to continue to support our lifestyle as we drive our carbon footprint to zero. Now, I've given scores of talks to thousands of people about climate change. And just about everyone has the same bottom line question. OK, that sounds bad. What can I do? Well, let's start with just three things that you have a direct impact, give you a direct impact on your carbon footprint as an individual. First, we need electricity to power our lights, appliances, and electronics. Now, if you live in a state with a deregulated electricity market like Texas or New York, you can buy renewable energy for the electricity in your home. Lifestyle impact, zero. 
The way it works is that they produce renewable energy with something like a wind farm. They put the energy into the grid, and they're allowed to sell as much as they make. Once again, lifestyle impact zero. It's just converting suppliers. Second, we need to get places. Now, clearly, mass transit's the way to go in terms of carbon footprint, but we still need cars. Electric cars charged with our green powered homes would reduce our carbon footprint from driving our cars. Now, there's some obstacles here. It's a big purchase, so you've got to buy a new car, but at least the next time you buy, you would go this way. Or maybe you're concerned about the range of an electric car and the technology you think isn't quite there. By the way, they're really very good now. Or maybe you have a problem with access to a charging station. Your backup plan is a hybrid car with excellent mileage. Lifestyle impact, zero. Third, we need warm homes. We need hot water. We can re replace our oil and gas burning systems with efficient technologies that use electricity. This is a pretty big project. And for those of us that live in apartment buildings, it's more complicated. But it pays off economically, ultimately. And again, lifestyle impact, zero. If we take these three steps, we'll be nearly halfway to a carbon-free future. We could do this in the next five years as a nation. We'd be way ahead of schedule on our current carbon reduction goals. And as a nation, we would set a fine example for the world. And we could take pride in that. But what about the other half of our carbon footprint? The rest is due to circumstances that are largely out of our control as individuals. The food and the products that we buy, going out to restaurants, the theater, the movies, sporting events, and all the activities that make that possible and all the other things that we have in our lives, they all contribute to our carbon footprint as a nation. For these activities to be carbon free, we must replace our global energy infrastructure with renewable energy sources such as solar and wind and geothermal. We must upgrade to a smart electric grid and deploy energy storage technologies to make sure that we have reliable energy. And to help us get there more quickly and affordably, we must also drive up energy efficiency in our buildings through better designs, retrofits of existing buildings, and improved operations and maintenance of our buildings. Again, we must ask ourselves whether we have loss aversion for our coal, oil, and gas infrastructure. Can we let go of it for a brighter future? Can we let go of the 700 oil refineries in the world and the 4,000 huge tankers, oil and gas tankers, some as long as the Empire State Building is high, knowing that last year was the hottest year on record ever, and that this year we are actually on track to break last year's record, and that by letting go we can slow global warming and reduce the risks of climate shock, can we let go of the 5,000 coal and gas burning power plants in the world and a few hundred thousand gas stations to slow the accelerated melting of the great sheet, ice sheets in Greenland and the Western Antarctic Peninsula to start to address sea level rise? Can we let go of 10,000 oil rigs, including offshore drilling platforms and more than a million gas wells in the world to slow the sixth mass extinction that we have precipitated in the 3.5 billion year history of life on Earth? Can we let go of the millions of earth movers that mine coal, train cars that are transported in the tanker trucks that are used to deliver gasoline so that we can retrain the people with the dirty jobs in the coal, oil, and gas industries and replace those jobs with more than double the number of jobs in retrofitting buildings and designing, building, and operating, and maintaining renewable energy plant? Can we let go of the 2.5 million miles of crude oil and gas pipeline that exists today? Enough pipeline to wrap around the equator of the Earth 100 times so that we might prevent food shortages and price hikes and even have a chance that all the people of all nations will have enough good food to eat and clean water to drink? Can we let go of more than one billion, one billion cars with combustion engines, knowing of the World Health Organization's determination that one out of every eight deaths worldwide is a premature death linked somehow to air pollution, much of which comes from the burning of coal, oil, and gas? 
so that the air can be clean from Argentina to Algeria and from Beijing to Bismarck? And finally, can we, as a society, let go of the $27 trillion, $27 trillion worth of coal, oil, and gas reserves that are in the ground, knowing that if we burn it all, we will surely bake the planet beyond recognition, and that if we leave it in the ground, that we will loosen the grip of dictators in oil-rich countries and remove petropolitics from geopolitics? I think we can. I know many of you were thinking, after that laundry list of all the things that we'd have to let go of, that this sounds expensive. But if knowing that the planet would no longer be habitable isn't enough of a reason for action, and that we insist that this trans transition must make economic sense, well, I have good news for us all. It does make economic sense. The economics are also viable. There are myriad well-vetted analyses by the experts such as the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change that conclude that addressing climate change will be costly, but delay would bear a much greater cost. This is the common theme among the economists. Ultimately, the good news, with the cost of renewable energy sources now reaching parity with coal, oil, and gas, is that much of this transition to a low-carbon society would occur driven by market forces alone. The problem is that the pace for phasing out coal, oil, and gas is too slow to avoid the worst effects of climate change. Our timeline doesn't align with nature's timeline, and not by a long shot. We need enforceable policies at all levels of government to cut emissions at a dramatic pace. Policies that will move items from my want-to-do list to my must-do list to overcome our resistance to change. But we would be naive not to acknowledge that the most profitable industry in history wields power and influence at the highest levels of government. But this can still work because we, too, have the option to wield considerable power and influence on our legislators' actions. We must acknowledge that our uh, lawmakers are unwilling or incapable of getting behind major legislation unless we overwhelm them in large numbers with the same message and demand action. Let's make them heroes that will be remembered for literally saving the planet. Here's what you can do. Tell your city council member and your mayor that you want enforceable legislation that will cap carbon emissions, both from large buildings and from, in, from the entire city, that you want electric vehicle-only parking spots with charging stations, and that you want 100% renewable energy for both the public and private sectors, as many cities have already committed to doing. Call your state representative and your governor and insist that they create policies that will streamline the process for upgrading our electricity grids, ramp up to 100% renewable energy at the state level, and drive up energy storage in our buildings. Write your representatives in Congress. Write your president. Tell them that you want strong federal policies to reduce industrial emissions, set efficiency standards, provide funds to states and cities to help them meet their goals, and that you want them to insist on extremely aggressive emission targets in global agreements. We must organize in large numbers to see these actions come to pass. It is truly the only way that we will succeed. And if we do, doing so could give the next generation a chance to build an even better world. And it could revive our optimism about the future, maybe even enough so. So that someone asks, who wants to go to 2070, that you'd raise a, a hand and say, I will. Thank you.